Forensic Psychology for AQA level. Revision in less than 25 minutes. Hi, I'm going to quickly cover all of the main content for the entire Forensic Psychology unit as quickly as I can. If you're short on time and need to check you haven't forgotten anything before your exam, this is the video for you. But if you're still a little uncertain about understanding the content in Forensic Psychology, then I've got a series of Forensic Psychology videos that I go much lower in, and I'll explain in depth all the concepts I'll be summarizing here. Even if you're short on time, it would actually only take around an hour to watch them all back to back. But if you just need to run over all this information quickly, we'd better get started. Psychboost.com, over 170 videos to help you with your qualification, and Patreon supporters can access bonus resources, tutorial videos, and the Discord channel. Offender profiling, the top-down approach. Offender profiling, assumptions about the characteristics of an offender are made by careful analysis of the offense they commit. A modus operandi, crime is not random. Offenders have a very distinctive way that they commit their crimes, also known as a criminal signature. The top-down approach is profilers creating pre-existing categories of offender types, organized and disorganized offenders. The profiler uses their own personal experience and intuition to fit the offender into one of these types, using crime scene evidence. Organized offenders plan their crime. They prepare by bringing weapons and restraints. They take care to tidy the crime scene and will hide the body. This reflects an average or higher than average intelligence. Disorganized offenders don't plan their crime in advance. They use weapons found at the crime scene. They leave messy crime scenes evidence. And they don't try to hide the body. This reflects a below average intelligence. Resler in 1986 created definitions of organized and disorganized offenders using interviews with real serial offenders. Classified 24 as organized and 12 as disorganized, suggesting distinct types of offender. This aids in apprehension. Resler used a restricted sample of only 36 serial offenders, so the results may not be generalizable to the wider criminal population. Snook, 2007. Major crime officers agreed that criminal profiling helps solve cases, 94%, and is a valuable investigative tool, 88.2% suggesting detectives feel offender profiling is effective in helping with their work. Cantor in 2004 reviewed 100 US serial killers, found disorganized features were rare, and didn't form a distinct type. This suggests a false dichotomy between the two types, and that organization is typical of most serial killers. The effectiveness of offender profiling is difficult to assess. This is because it's never used in isolation. Other forensic techniques are used, so it can be difficult to identify how much a profile contributed to solving a particular case. Offender profiling, the bottom-up approach. Bottom-up approach, an evidence-based approach using statistical analysis of data collected at the crime scene and information such as choice of victim and location, also referred to as investigative psychology, and it was developed by David Cantor. The five-factor model, interpersonal coherence, interactions while the same in personal life, time and place significance, criminal characteristics, criminal career, so changes with experience, and forensic awareness, a knowledge of police techniques. Geographical profiling. It's a branch of investigative psychology and focused on where an offender is likely to be based, not on personal characteristics, assumes the location of crime is not random, and helps investigators narrow down search areas. Least effort principle. The closest suitable crime scene to the criminal's home base is picked. This means fewer crimes further away distance decay. The circle hypothesis. Crimes radiate out from the home base, creating a circle. Marauders. Commuters travel away from the home base. Cantor and Larkin, 1993, found 87% of 45 British serial sexual assaulters were marauders, and this supports the circle hypothesis, and the idea that the choice of place of crime is a significant factor in offender behaviour. But it can be difficult to know if a criminal is a marauder or commuter before being apprehended. It can also be difficult to distinguish offences by separate offenders. The number of offences could be small, or not all of the offences could be recorded. Bottom-up makes inferences based on statistical analysis, from published research. That means it's seen as more scientific than top-down, which relies on the intuition and experience of individual criminal profilers. But all profiling methods suffer from the problem of statistically abnormal offenders. These people's behaviour wouldn't match what would be expected by intuition, based on experience or by considering what's statistically probable, as both of these are based on previously solved cases of offenders who have actually been caught. Biological explanations. A historical approach. 
Older explanations of criminality were often religious, suggesting criminals were possessed by demons. Lombroso attempted to produce a scientific theory of the atavistic form, published in The Criminal Man in 1876. The atavistic form means criminals genetically are at a more primitive stage of human evolution than non-criminals. So are throwbacks, meaning criminality is innate, so criminals are born, not made. Physical differences. Criminals are thought to resemble ancestors. They have asymmetrical faces, heavy brows, very small or big ears that stick out, large jaws and excessively long arms. Different types of criminals can be identified. Thieves have upturned noses and murderers have hook-beak noses. The Positive School of Criminology argues that criminal behaviour has distinct characteristics and careful measurement of criminals will reveal the causes of criminal behaviour. Lombroso made biological measurements of over 4,000 criminals. Lombroso's work was conducted with careful measurements, paving the way for more scientific approaches to criminal research. He rejected free will in favour of biological determinism, suggesting the causes of crime were outside of the criminal's control. Lombroso's research, while using careful scientific measurements, was flawed, as no control group was used. Goring, in 1913, compared biological measurements of 3,000 criminals with 3,000 non-criminals. When controlling for factors like age and class and intelligence, no physical differences were found between the criminals and the non-criminals. Atavistic form is an example of scientific racism, claiming biological features such as dark skin identify criminality. This has influenced racist policies of eugenics and biased IQ testing that's harmed black communities. Atavistic form might confuse cause and effect. It might be that people with certain physical features are rejected by society and turned to crime and this then results in a criminal stereotype that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Biological explanations, genetic and neural explanations. Genetic explanations. Inherited genotypes makes the display of criminal behavior, the phenotype, more likely. For example, violence. Family studies. Twin and adoption studies try to show people with biological criminal relations are more likely to be criminals themselves. Gene candidates. The short variant MOA gene, produces less MOA. It's linked to high levels of criminal behaviour, including aggression. Diaphesis stress. Some genes are only expressed due to an interaction with the environment, for example, child abuse with MOA. Neural explanations. Biological processes, biochemistry, and neural structures within the brain lead to criminal behaviour. Neurotransmitters. An imbalance is linked to offending. Neuroadrenaline, with aggression. Serotonin, with impulsivity. Neurological structures. Low limbic system activity is linked with not experiencing empathy. An underdeveloped frontal cortex is linked with poor impulse control. Re, 2002. 51 twin adoption studies were included in a large meta-analysis. The results of the data analysis found that genetics accounted for 41% of the variance in antisocial behaviour and environmental effects, 59%. This suggests that hereditary genetic factors are a significant driver of antisocial crime. Brunner, 1993, conducted a case study on a family in the Netherlands. The males had a history of impulsive aggression. Five males had defective MOA genes producing no MOA. This suggests extreme levels of criminality can have a genetic origin. Rain, in 2000, measured the volume of the frontal lobe in people with APD, antisocial personality disorder, and compared this to people without APD. It was found people of APD had an 11% reduction in prefrontal grey matter. Biological explanations are biologically determinist, so socially sensitive. For example, genetic theories can be used to justify policies that discriminate. Reductionist. A more valid understanding would also consider drug abuse, any mental illnesses, and abuse in childhood. Psychological explanations. Eisnick's theory. Eisnick thought personality type had a biological basis. That criminal personality is due to the type of nervous system we inherit. Arousal is how easily the nervous system responds to a stimulus, influencing behaviour, leading to innate offending behaviour. The theory of the criminal personality is based on three personality dimensions, extrovert to introvert, neurotic to stable, and psychotism. Extrovert, chronically underaroused nervous systems mean the person will attention seek for stimulation, and they're hard to condition and socialise. Neurotic means the person is easy to upset, they're overly anxious and they show obsessive behaviours due to a nervous system that is easily triggered by threats. Psychotism is measured on a scale of low to high. Psychotics are emotionally cold and don't feel compassion. Score. Most people score low on psychotism, 
but even numbers of people on either sides of the other two measures. The criminal personality then is high on extrovert, neurotic and psychotism measures. McGurk and Duggall, 1981 conducted an Eisnick personality questionnaire to 100 convicted inmates and 100 trade-based students. A higher number of people with extrovert, neurotic and psychotic personality types were in the delinquent group. Eisnick's theory though depends on one stable criminal personality type over time. Moffat argues this is too simplistic and suggests a dual taxonomy. Life course persistent, who are people who are stable in offending behaviour over their life, and adolescent limited, those who stop antisocial behaviour in adulthood. This better explains offending figures that show 10 times higher levels of crime in adolescence. Digman in 1990 suggested a five-factor model, which includes other important dimensions of personality, conscientiousness and agreeableness. These might be more important in criminality, as not all extrovert, neurotic and psychotic personality types become criminals. And finally, suggesting criminality is based on the type of nervous system you inherit raises the issue of biological determinism. Psychological explanations, cognitive explanations. Cognitive explanations suggest that there are ways of thinking, there are internal mental processes about the world and moral decisions that lead to offending behaviour. Levels of moral reasoning. Kohlberg in 1969 suggests that through development we grain greater moral maturity in three levels. Pre-conventional level. Criminals are argued to be stuck at this level, concerned only with how their actions affect them personally, either due to punishment in stage one or rewards in stage two. They don't progress to conventional or post-conventional. Cognitive distortions. These are failures of the mind in accurately representing reality and can lead to criminal behaviour. Hostile attribution bias. This is when inferences on other people's internal mental states are biased, assuming negative intentions. Minimalization. This is when we interpret our own behaviour as less serious than it really is. For example, denying our actions caused harm. Holland and Palmer, 1998. Male offenders showed poor moral reasoning on 10 of the 11 questions on moral reasoning compared to male non-offenders. This suggests offenders do have developmental moral deficits. Understanding the link between offending behaviour and cognitive processing means cognitive behavioural therapy could be used to change offenders' rational thinking. This application of psychological research could reduce the cost offending has on society. But Kohlberg's theory is based on the use of hypothetical dilemma tasks. It's likely due to social desirability bias, people are unlikely to respond honestly, or even know how they would act. This limits generalizability to real-life offences. When women were tested, they appeared to be less morally developed. As men are significantly more likely to be offenders, this suggests that Kohlberg's ideas are not generalizable. Gilligan in 1982 argued that Kohlberg's entire theory is gender-biased, focusing on male ideas of justice, not female ideas of care. Psychological Explanations – Differential Association Theory Sutherland suggests that criminality is a learnt response. Crime is a cultural tradition, and criminals associate with other criminals. Socialisation is the process that we learn our norms and values. We're socialised by the people around us. Differential association means that everyone is socialised differently, as we all have unique or different sets of people around us. Pro-criminal attitudes Criminals are socialised too but by people with deviant norms and values. For example, seeing crime as positive. Reinforced. Criminal behaviour is reinforced by both material rewards and the expectations and approval of the people we associate with. Offending techniques are passed to the next generation or across peer groups. For example, how to pick a lock or commit tax fraud. This theory explains why certain crimes are performed by certain social groups of people. For example, white collar crimes. Different peer groups will have different opinions on what types of crime are acceptable. There are practical applications of this theory. Don't put first-time offenders in the same prison as experienced criminals, because they might reinforce pro-criminal attitudes and pass on techniques. This was a rejection of racist views of born criminals popular in Sutherland's time. People used eugenic genetic arguments of criminality to perform forced sterilization on criminals so they couldn't pass on criminal genes. But this theory can't explain why younger males are far more likely to commit crime than older males, as older males will have had far more exposure to pro-criminal attitudes, or why most crime is committed by males. Evidence for differential associational theory is always going to be correlational, and can be explained just as well by genetic inheritance in families. Psychological explanations, psychodynamic explanations. This theory is about the role of the parent-child relationship in developing a criminal personality and unconscious mental processes. The superego explanation. The superego is the morality principle. It's formed in the phallic stage by identifying with the same-sex parent. 
the superego attempts to regulate behavior by giving feelings of guilt and pride. An underdeveloped superego is weak due to no identification with the same-sex parent. An overdeveloped superego is too strong. This is due to over-identification. They commit crime in order to satisfy the need to punish themselves. A deviant superego. Identification is normal, but parent is a criminal, so behaviors imitated are criminal. Defense mechanisms. These are unconscious mental processes used to avoid anxiety. Denial. The criminal rejects the reality or serious nature of their crimes. Displacement. Criminals release their anger onto weaker targets. Rationalization. Criminals argue their crime is justified in some way. Attachment theory. Due to an insecure attachment as an infant, their internal working model for a relationship lacks trust, leading to negative interactions, meaning crime, and maternal deprivation results in affectionless psychopathy, no empathy, and that results in delinquent children. Theories on the link between early childhood experience and later criminality can be applied to reduce crime. Freud's ideas can be used to ensure that children's superego is not under or overdeveloped with parenting classes. Many Freudian concepts like the superego are not directly observable or falsifiable, meaning as an explanation of offending behaviour, it can't be empirically tested, so will always be an unscientific explanation of criminality. Freud suggests that as females don't resolve the Oedipus complex, they should have weaker superegos, and so be less moral. This is an example of alpha bias, and is likely due to Freud's own androcentric worldview. Offending data clearly shows across cultures females are less likely to be offenders than males, a direct counter to Freud's theory. Dealing with offending behaviour, custodial sentencing. Custodial sentencing is holding criminals in a secure facility, a prison, young offenders institution, or psychiatric hospital. Its aims are deterrence, to stop criminals re-offending and to be an example to other members of society. To incapacitate, to protect society from the criminal's actions while they're in prison. As retribution, providing the victim and society a sense that criminals have paid for their crime. Rehabilitation, to change behaviour by learning new skills, training and behaviour therapy. Psychological effects are depression, feelings of helplessness resulting in high levels of stress and self-harm and suicide. Institutionalization. Prisoners adapt to the prison environment and routines and after release struggle to adjust to life on the outside. Deindividuation. Prisoners can strip people of their sense of socialized individual identity and result in aggression. Recidivism. When an offender re-offends after release, this could be due to institutionalization or developing pro-criminal attitudes. Many members of wide society think given offenders long custodial sentences, especially in difficult prison environments, is an appropriate punishment for crimes. This provides suitable retribution for the victims. Many ex-inmates re-offend, 77% according to one 2020 study. Prisons may not deter or reform offenders and only incapacitate. However, as re-offending rates are much higher for short sentences of less than 6 months, 84.9%, compared to more than 4 years of 32.2%, it could be argued that shorter sentences are just not long enough to deter or reform. Custodial sentencing is expensive. The cost per prisoner per year in the UK in 2020 is over £42,000. Considering the implications of differential association, custodial sentencing may be counterproductive. It could be that putting large numbers of criminals together reinforces pro-criminal attitudes and the sharing of criminal skills. Dealing with offender behaviour, behaviour modification. Behaviour modification. This is based on the behaviourist idea that desirable behaviours can be learnt. Operant conditioning. The principles of reinforcement and punishment are applied in prison token economy systems. Token economy. Offenders are systematically rewarded with tokens for predefined desired target behaviours. Secondary reinforcers. Tokens can be exchanged later for primary reinforcers, chocolate or saved up for larger rewards. Negative punishment. Bad behaviour might result in tokens being taken away. Hobbs and Holt in 1976 developed a token economy system for young offenders at a residential school for delinquent males. There was a significant increase in appropriate behaviour in the students taking part in the token economy, with no improvement in the control group, suggesting token economy is effective. Token economy is easy to set up within a prison, not needing highly trained specialists, meaning it can be an effective way of dealing with offending behaviour within the prison environment, improving conditions for staff and prisoners. Token economy is limited, in that it can only be used effectively in the controlled setting, like a prison. It has no long-term effects in reducing recidivism. Dealing with offender behaviour. Anger management. Anger management. 
Aggressive emotional responses are cognitive processes and can be controlled with a form of cognitive behavior therapy. This provides techniques offenders can use in future stressful situations. Stage one, cognitive preparation. Offenders learn how to assess their own thoughts for triggers of irrational aggressive emotion. Examples from their lives are used and reinterpreted. Stage two, skills acquisition. Ways to control anger are developed from calming relaxation exercises to improving communication skills to avoid conflict. Stage three, application practice. Therapists and offender play out role play scenarios that would have caused aggressive responses in the past. Offenders use skills developed in two to stay calm. Ireland, 2004, tested a group-based anger management program. Self-report questionnaires were completed before and after the intervention and behavioral checklist reports from prison staff. 48% of the experimental group showed improvement on both measures, with the biggest improvement in the most aggressive prisoners, suggesting it's effective. Research using self-reports, though, often has a problem of social desirability bias. In this type of study, the risks are much higher as prisoners might hope for early release. Skills developed in anger management programs can be applied outside of the prison, potentially helping prisoners retain employment and their relationships. Dealing with offending behavior, restorative justice. Restorative justice programs are intended to rehabilitate the offender by getting them to cognitively understand the effect their crime has had on the victim and wider society. This could be by direct reconciliation with the victim or paying back the victim or wider society. This process restores what the offender harmed. Meeting. The victim and offender take part in a meeting supervised by a trained mediator. This meeting is collaborative and the victim is given the opportunity to explain to the criminal the harm caused to them. The offender is encouraged to take responsibility. Reparation. The offender demonstrates acceptance of responsibility by in some way repaying. This could be a cash payment or it could be in the form of community service. The Ministry of Justice conducted an evaluation of free restorative justice schemes. It found 1. that there was a 14% reduction in recidivism, 2. 62% of victims felt better after the process, only 2% worse, and 3. For every £1 spent on restorative justice, £8 was saved from a reduction in recidivism. Restorative justice depends on the victim cooperating. This may not be the case if the victim feels the offender will be playing along to avoid a harsher sentence. None of the ways of dealing with offending behaviour are mutually exclusive. If all are somewhat effective, they could be used in a holistic combined approach. However, many members of society will only accept long and potentially unpleasant custodial sentences for offenders. Seeing this as retribution, restorative justice is considered by many to be a soft option and just not a deterrent. Well, I hope that helped with your revision. If you want more help with this unit, for sign-ups patrons, I've got a quiz, mind map, and essay plan. For Neuron patrons, I've got bonus videos, and in them, I answer real exam questions on this topic and give tips, telling you what students did right and wrong in the real exam. But for everyone, like and subscribe for videos right up to your exams.